Welcome to Family Bible Time. We're in Jeremiah 34, and we're in Psalm 5 and 6. <clears throat> Psalms 5 and 6, Jeremiah 34. Let's pray and let's go. Lord, thank you for your word. We pray your blessing upon it now. Please teach us and lead us. And forgive us our sins and lead us in the truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Jeremiah 34, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion and all the peoples, that's a lot of people, by the way, were fighting against Jerusalem and all of its cities. So that's just the way it went. There was this massive army with the Babylonians because they'd conquered the rest of the world. And so mm -hmm. people were joining in on the side of the Babylonians. And then hey, all these people came, and they were now conquering Jerusalem, but not only they were in, in besieging Jerusalem, but they were also the surrounding cities, the cities that belonged to Jerusalem. Verse 2, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. You shall not escape from his hand, but shall surely be captured and delivered into his hand. You shall see the king of Babylon eye to eye and speak with him face to face, and you shall go to Babylon. Now, um, do you remember this from the other day? This is what? Zedekiah complained about Jeremiah about. He said, why are you saying this? You know, and they quoted this. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O, king, o Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord concerning you, you shall not die by the sword, you shall die in peace. And as spices were burned for your fathers, the former kings who were before you, so people shall burn spices for you and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for I have spoken. I have spoken the word, declares the Lord. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah in Jerusalem, when, when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left. Lachish and Azekar, for these were the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them, that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and female, so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. And they obeyed all the officials and all the people who had entered into the covenant that everyone should free his slave, male or female, so that they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free. Now stop there for a moment. Just think about this. Uh, Remember the law, the Old Testament law for the people of Israel was that they were not allowed to make slaves of their fellow Hebrews. <clears throat> they had to, they could take them on as indentured servants, but only for six years. And then in the seventh year, they had to set them free. So basically, you could, as a Jew, you could, if you got into financial difficulty, you could sell yourself to someone else as a slave. Uh, you could sell members of your family to someone else as a slave. And you could say, you, you'd say you can have them for, for six years, but on the seventh year I get them back. Or on the seventh year I get set free. In other words, you can have all my work for the next six years. But this is not like slavery the way we think about slavery. This is just like selling yourself, it's like signing a contract for a company saying, I'm going to work for you for the next seven years. And please give me my wages or give my dad my wages all seven years in advance now. 
And by the way, you're going to have to look after me and feed me and house me and look after, care for me and so on for the whole seven years. So here's the amount to buy six, sorry, did I say seven years? I meant six years of labor. But they weren't following that. They weren't letting their slaves go free. They were basically pers pursuing a form of, you would say, unrighteous slavery, slavery that God did not regulate or permit, whereby they just didn't let them go free. And, and is God okay with that? No, God is not okay with that. And um, so that God was punishing them for that amongst other things. Now, in an effort, so here are the armies of the Babylonians outside the city wall, and the cities of Judah are falling. It's only Lachish and Hezekiah that are left. And what does King Zedekiah do? Oh, we're in trouble. What do the nobles and the officials do? Oh, we're in trouble. Oh, well, what should we do now? People like Jeremiah had been proclaiming, do justice. Do justice. Repent. Stop oppressing people. And what that meant was, well, set those slaves free. You can understand where our forefathers got, got it from when they said, you know, people um, in this country and in America, when they, when they realized, hang on a minute, slavery as it's practiced in our country is just sinful. It's just wrong. And we've got to set those slaves free. And you've got the abolitionist movement began in, in Britain and also in America. And, um, and, and we could just thank God that people um, read the Bible and came to this and came to the conclusions that like we can today, hang on a minute, God is not okay with enslaving people and just keeping them as 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 slaves forever and indentured service is one thing but the kind of slavery that was being practiced in this country and in, in america is another thing altogether and, and and so they could see that by studying verses like this anyway they obeyed and set them free at the end of verse 10 and you say now was that really what they wanted to do, or did they just see the writing on the wall with the armies at the gates? Mm -hmm. But afterwards, verse 11, they turned around and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them into subjection as slaves. What? How did they do that? Well, they were very powerful people. These were the nobles. These were the people with the army on their side. These were the people who were the rich and powerful in their day. And, and you can see now what the Lord thinks about that. Mm -hmm. Verse 12. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage, saying, at the end of seven years, each of you must set free the fellow Hebrew who has been sold to you and has served for six years, served you six years. You must set him free from your service. But your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You recently repented. It's interesting, God calls it repentance, a change of mind and heart, a turning around and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty each to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves whom you had set free according to their desire. In other words, they didn't want to, be, they didn't want to stay with you. They wanted out. And you brought them into subjection to be your slaves. Therefore, thus says the Lord, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty, everyone to his brother and to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim you liberty to the sword, to pestilence and to famine, declares the Lord. I will make you a horror to all kingdoms of the earth. And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, 
I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. Now, this was the habit when they made a covenant. Remember that? They would cut an animal in half. And then they would walk through the to, between the halves of the animal and they're effectively saying to God, Lord, I promise, I covenant this and may I be made like these two halves of the dead animal. May my blood be poured out like that animal's blood was poured out mm-hmm. if I break the covenant. Well, these guys had made a covenant with God about setting the slaves free and they've walked through the halves of the animals. Oh, yeah, we're going to set the slaves free. And then a little while later, they took the slaves back, no doubt by force. Mm. So God says, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. And I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives. Their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And Zedekiah, king of Judah and his officials, I will give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of the army, the king of Babylon, of the king of Babylon, which which has withdrawn from you. Behold, I will command, declares the Lord, and will bring them back to this city, and they will fight against it, and take it, and burn it with fire. I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Whoa, stay there for a second. That's the end of the chapter, by the way. Now, what's going on? So, the the armies of the king of Babylon did what? They withdrew. And so what's going on? Actually, the Egyptian army turned up. And we're going to read about that in the, in the next few chapters. But the Egyptian army turned up. And the Babylonians withdrew from the city, presumably to take up a better defensive position, or maybe to go and attack the Egyptian army. But the Egyptian army turned up. So this is very interesting, because it gives us insight into what was going on in the hearts and the minds of those officials, the the nobles, the priests, and so on, people who were in charge of Jerusalem and the nation. When the army of the Babylonians looked like they were about to take the city, in desperation, they said, oh, well, uh, let's repent. Let's make a covenant. Let's cut a calf in half. Let's walk between the half. We promise to set all our slaves free. We're going to now we will be good. Mm. Why? Because we're in terrible trouble. And it looks like we're about to face the consequences of our sin. Mm. And then the Babylonian army withdrew. Mm. And they thought, hang on a minute. We've just given up our slaves. Actually, we'll take them back. Now, it's very interesting, isn't it? Do you remember me saying to you, like, you, you, you know, a long time ago, I said, like, you know, if you're saying you believe in, in the Lord, your faith will be tested. It will be tested. Are you really believing in the Lord? Uh, this is the way it goes. Look, you say, you say I tr- I'm trusting Jesus. All right, that faith is going to be tested in some way. You're going to have to decide, do I really trust the Lord? Or do I really want a life of sin? Which way am I going to go? And you'll have lots of tests. The testing of your faith, by the way, when it's proved to be genuine, that tested genuineness of your faith is more precious than gold. That's what the Bible says. So the testing of your faith is a good thing. Like like Abraham, he believed God. It was credited to him as righteousness. But then in, that was chapter 15. And in chapter 7, in chapter 22, um, it says sometime later, God tested Abraham. James tells us that actually it was when Abraham's faith was tested, it was proved to be right by his works, by his offering up Isaac. That showed his faith to be real. Mm. And so the word (coughs) which was spoken 
Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, was proved to be true. So that the, the, de the demonstration of faith and the declaration of, the, of faith that we make when we say, I believe, is going to be proved true when we are tested and show that we believe. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so your works demonstrate your faith. Faith always produces good works. That's what James 2 teaches us. Now, this is the opposite, isn't it? They were saying, oh, we, we're going to follow God. We believe, well, we fear God, we're repenting. And that was when the enemies were at the gates. And then the enemies withdrew. Now, what was that when the enemies withdrew? Well, that was a test, wasn't it? That was a, a, a test of things going well. Maybe you don't think about, mm -hmm. about this, but God can test your faith when things go well. Mm -hmm. Oh, somebody trusts you. Somebody says to you, okay, I'll give you this, I trust you. And it's a test. <laughs> are you going to... Are you going to take the trust and show yourself to be trustworthy? God gives them a bit of freedom. Are they going to show themselves to be trustworthy or not? No, they went straight back to their sin. And that showed God who they really were. And God said, okay, that's it. Now, God tests us in all sorts of ways like that. He tested the people of Israel by blessing them. Sometimes blessings are harder tests than trials. Praise. Well. Praise, yeah. When you're praised, it's the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold. And the Lord tests hearts. Another one of those proverbs says um, that um, a man is tested by his praise. So when people say you're beautiful, is it going to go to your head? Nobody ever says that to me. But um, when people say to me, I was a great sermon. Do you know what Spurgeon said when a woman said that to him? He said, yes, madam, the devil already told me. <laughs> but it's so true. You know, it's, it's, it, it's such a, praise is such a dangerous thing. It's not wrong to, Praise people, honour where honour is due, the Bible says. Um, but it's, it, it, is, it is something that is a test, isn't it? If you get luxury, if you get money, if you get um, time, God gives you time. Or your parents give you time. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to waste it? Are you just going to spend it on yourself? Are you just going to fritter it away? Or are you going to serve the Lord with it? You know, I mean, that it's all a test, isn't it? So this is really helpful, I think. Um, I think it's really helpful also to see the very painful pattern that's here. Mm -hmm. People say that they've repented, but then they return to the sins that they can't bear to be without. Mm -hmm. So what about you? What are, the, what are your sins? What are your sins that you say you've repented of? Are you willing to put them away? Are you willing to... And it, it, it's something sometimes that we have to do like day after day. No, I will not do that. I can't believe that I'm still tempted to do it. I can't believe that I almost did it. I can't believe... And now a Christian can say this. I can't believe I fell into it again. Lord, I repent immediately. I'm not, I'm not walking in that sin. I'm not, I'm not going to do that at all. That's a Christian. I am repenting and I will keep on repenting. That's a Christian. Um, but there are, many, there are many people who say, oh, yeah, but you know what? It wasn't so bad. I, what was... I don't know why I was worrying so much. Let me go back to it. Because that was really nice when I had slaves. So let me just take the slaves back. Hmm. And they go back to it. And they're proven to be unbelievers. Okay? 
Psalm six, uh, Psalm five. This, these for Psalm five and six are just wonderful. Um, give uh, to the choir master. Hmm. Hang on a minute. They had a choir master for the flutes. They had flutes. A Psalm of David. Give ear to my words, O God, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry. My King and my God, for to you do I pray. O oh Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Now here's a good question. We don't sacrifice. But did you this morning? I did because I read this. But I have to repeatedly. Did you go to God saying, Lord, I need your sacrifice. I need Jesus to pay the price for all my sins. Please forgive me. Wash me of my sin. That's what David's saying. I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. He's, he's saying in the morning, uh, you hear my voice. I'm going to pray to you, but I'm also going to come to you wanting forgiveness. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Now, just get that straight for a second. What's that phrase that people say? Uh, God hates the sin but loves the sinner. Mm. Uh, hang on a minute. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. Oh, that's like, God hates the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. And he's not okay with people that speak lies either, is he? Verse 5, you hate all evildoers. Uh-oh, uh-oh. So it, does God only hate the sin or does God also hate the sinner? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Because David sinned. So he was a sinner. But he repented of his sin, didn't he? So the question is, if you, if you won't repent of your sin and your sin is stuck to you like a stain, it's, it, it's, your sin is, is like a homing beacon for God's wrath, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, like, it's like a beacon... It's like a GPS signal just calling down God's wrath upon you. This is terrifying, isn't it? So, so God is actually against you. God is not, you know, it's not, oh, well, God hates my sin, but he loves me. Yeah, but you love your sin. So, hang on a minute, you hate God, you're his enemy. That's not, that's, God isn't mocked, is he? Anyway. Now, what about David? Because he's a sinner, isn't he? And he's just confessed that by saying, I, I prepare a sacrifice for you in the morning. So what's his hope? Verse 7, but, but I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. So David's hope is not in his own righteousness to come into God's house, but in God's steadfast love towards him, David's saying, because you have loved me and, and covenanted yourself in love to me, I can enter your house. I'm going to be able to enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. He's saying, I don't want to be walking in my sins. Now, is that you? Are you coming to the Lord saying, forgive me my sins? And Lord, I, I don't... I realize you hate the wicked and you hate, you hate wickedness and blood. Lord, but I don't want that. I want you. I want righteousness. And my hope is in you. Well, this is good, isn't it? You're in the same place as David right now. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. For there's no truth in them now. Their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Now, this is now getting, giving us some insight into David's troubles. And he's obviously 
dealing with flatterers who are actually against him. He had to deal with a lot of that. Deceit, deception, um, the betrayal. And what does he say about these wicked people who are intent, they're bloodthirsty, they're evil, they're intent on their sin, and they're, they're just they're trying to trap him, but they're flattering him. Verse 10, make them bear their guilt, O God. They're trying to get him to bear his guilt. Make them bear their guilt, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. They're trying to bring him down, but he's saying, trap him. But he's saying, you know, Lord, turn the traps on them. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they've rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. So, now hang on a minute. If one of those enemies were, were to take refuge in God, mm. well then David's prayer would apply to them, wouldn't it? Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them. Let those who love your name that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord, and you cover him with favor as a shield. This is so good, isn't it? So David's saying, Lord, those people who are set against you and who just are, are in love with their sins and they're your enemies and they're turning on me, oh God, deal with them. But everyone who seeks you, Lord, save them and protect them. Uh, and and so we we can we can bait, take the the same approach in our prayers and um, we can say also lord have mercy upon our enemies and save them that's like jesus isn't it all right verse 1 in psalm 6 to the choir master hmm. it seems they had a choir master with stringed instruments according to the shemineth they had stringed instruments and so on. And flutes. They seems like they were okay with instruments in their worship. Hmm. A Psalm of David. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Hang on. Why would he be worried about that? Because David had sinned. Okay. Be gracious to me, O Lord, oh Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, for my bones are troubled. <laughs> I feel you, David. <laughs> I feel you in the night, and I feel you when I get up in the morning. <laughs> my bones are troubled. Are your bones troubled? Anyway, my soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O oh Lord, how long? Turn, O oh Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there's no remembrance of you and shall who will give you praise. I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. Wow, poor David, what's going on? I drench my couch with weeping. Hang on, David, aren't you a proper man? Weren't you told that what, it's it's you're not supposed to cry? <laughs> yeah. But actually, David lived the inner life. If you're following the series that I'm preaching through at the moment in Grace Life London, we're going through biblical masculinity. And the first feature of biblical masculinity that I tried to pull out of Genesis 1 to 3, uh, the first one is that God made men to be spiritual, spiritual. And that's, we're supposed to have this connection with God. We're supposed to have this inner life. We've got souls. We're supposed to care about others. We're supposed to be able to love and be loved. We're supposed to be able to know joy and sadness. And, and we're made in the image of God. We're not made to be brutes. Um, now, there's some benefit, and I'm going to say, actually, it's a good thing when men learn to control their emotions. Why? Well, because you have to do in this life, you have to do some hard things sometimes. Sometimes there are battles to be fought. Sometimes there are, are people to be withstood. Sometimes there's, there are issues which are, um, are really 
bad and someone has to keep a cool head. And it's not good as a leader to be just crumpling and crying in a crisis. That's a good thing when men learn to control their emotions. Actually, it's a good thing when women learn to control their emotions, which is why you've heard me say to you endlessly, all right, suck it up, girl. <laughs> this is, you can't, no, no, this is not the time. Now's the time for calmness. And you've got to learn that in life not to be just dominated and ruled by your emotions. And so that's a good feature of manliness, to be able to, to, to zip it, to be able to button, your, button things up, to be able to bury your emotions at a time, to have a cool head. Great! Actually, Jesus wept over Jerusalem, didn't he, on his way in. David wept over these situations. David and Jesus poured out their souls to God. Hebrews tells us that he was heard because of his strong cries and tears. There's Jesus going to God in prayer, crying out to him. He lived the true life of a perfect human and he cried. And, and, and that's, it, there's a problem with us when men, when we learn so much to bury our spiritual life that we just don't feel. We don't we don't have a concern. Wow, is that gone? Okay. Right. I'm nearly done. I'm, the, the psalm's almost ended. <laughs> Bear with me. There's a problem there, isn't there? But, but, come on, let's get back to this. This is an example for us of true spiritual manliness. So men, when was the last time you poured out your soul to God? When was the last time you did what the Bible tells us? To cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. When was the last time you wept, inwardly or outwardly? I'm not so worried, but when was the last time you wept over sorrows that were spiritual, other people's problems? When did they bring you to tears? Well, if you're the more spiritual you are, the more that will happen. And if you live your life as if God didn't exist, as if heaven was not real and hell was not real and suffering was not real, and you try and adopt the stoic approach just to kind of deny it all, that's not biblical man manliness. That's not biblical masculinity. David drenched his couch with his weeping. My eye wastes away because of grief. It grows weak because of all my foes. He's got foes and they're causing him woes. And it ends up with him just groaning and crying. All right. How does he feel about it? Well, verse 8. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. Hold on. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. <laughs> weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning, right? You weep out your woes to God, and look at what wakes you up in the morning. A faith in God. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and greatly troubled. They shall turn back and be put to shame in a moment. This is David. Nothing's changed. But he's suddenly gone from being full of woes to full of hope, to full of faith, to full of confidence. God has heard my prayer. Now, listen, many of us don't get there because we don't truly pour out our hearts to God. Our old pastor used to say to us, look, it's not enough just to go through your daily prayers. It's, it's just not enough. A Christian needs to get alone with God for an extended period of time. This is why when we go on holiday, um, Mummy and I will give each other a day. That's why we said to you, maybe you need to start having just a day with the Lord so that you can really try to draw near to him and pour out your heart to him. Just cry out to him. Tell him all that's on your heart. Think over the things that trouble you, that burden you, and pour them out to God. Look, when you do like David, 
that's when you get to this point when you realize the Lord has heard my prayers and accepted my plea. He accepts my prayers. How? Well, through Jesus dying for our sins. But, but also through us praying, right? So our prayers are made acceptable through Christ, but we do actually have to pray. So when we pour out all our prayers and we know God has heard them and we know God is actually going to answer them. And you can have this confidence that David has. Huh, it's going to be all right. <laughs> my enemies are going to be defeated. They're going to turn, turn their backs because God has heard my prayer. Well, Lord, we pray that you would enable us to pray. Above all, please give us the power to pray. Mm -hmm. Because we know that if we have your ear, we have everything. Mm -hmm. Lord, please bless us. Please forgive us. Help us to walk this path. Yes, to weep. Yes, to groan. Yes, to cry out to you like David, like your own son did but also to come to this steady hope and faith and confidence in you like, like David did, like, like Jesus did, walking from weeping in the garden, resigning himself to your will and standing silent before Pilate, silent before his accusers. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we ask you to help us to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're done. God bless you. Oh, Psalms are good, aren't they? <laughs> it, it's good to be in the Psalms. Someone said that in the comments. I agree. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.